How many of you are the daily to-do list kind of people? How many, oh, a lot of hands out there, right? Some of us, it's sticky notes, right? You got them scattered all over the place. Maybe for some, it's a day planner. Uh, some of you church workers I see out there that are as old or older than I am, remember those days, those AAL spiral bound notebooks that you had to put everything in there, right? Uh, I now use my phone actually, but I'm a daily to-do list kind of guy. Uh, and every now and then, my list is interrupted. And then that interruption is followed with an interruption. And that interruption is maybe followed with an interruption. True story, as I was preparing this week's message, Kaylee came in and said, do you mind if I interrupt you? <laughs> thought it kind of ironic, and then I thought at least she was polite enough to A, ask if I could be interrupted, and B, recognize that it was indeed an interruption. You know those times when you are interrupted? and the interrupter does not realize it is an interruption, nor do they ask permission to do the interruption, your response might not be as polite, correct? Sometimes it becomes rather frustrating when it's interruption after interruption after interruption after interruption, and you get nothing accomplished. But there are those occasions, there are those times, and maybe you've experienced it, where your day is interruption, after interruption, after interruption, after interruption, nothing is getting checked off your list, and yet you are having an incredibly productive day. And at the end of it, you might even say, this was a great day, I got a lot of great stuff done, even though your list is gonna start off that big tomorrow. Jesus had such a day. Today's text. You heard Pastor Seth read it a bit ago. Jesus faces interruption after interruption after interruption until he interrupts and interrupts some more. Setting the stage, Jesus has just sailed across the lake, has had his disciples take him to the other side of the sea. And if, if Jesus had a to-do list, uh, I'm sure it probably started with heal the sick, maybe ended with cast out the demons, and sandwiched right between it would have been teach the people. So Jesus has made it to the other side of the sea. He, he begins teaching the people. And suddenly he is interrupted. Master, my little daughter is dying. Can you come and save her? Notice Jesus doesn't say, I'm two of three points in, can you give me another seven minutes? Doesn't even address the student body. Hey guys, sorry I'm cutting the lesson short today. I... He just heads out. The interruption is received. My little daughter is dying. And without explanation, he receives the interruption and jumps into action. Out he heads with Jairus. No dismissal of class. Not so much as an amen, they make their way to Jairus' hometown. Now, quick interruption from this important message over here. Some of you, if, if on your daily routine, it's, it's pay attention to the news. Well, let me interrupt that thought for a moment. If some of you, it's pay no attention to the news, it's better for me, I completely understand it, but back to this one. If some of your daily routine is pay attention to the news, maybe a better part of a week ago, you might have heard a, a great discovery was found. A text, a translation, it tells us all about Jesus' childhood. Any of you see that in the news? Uh, some of you? 
A few of you up there, all right. Talked about how, you know, Jesus was making clay pigeons and said, fly, be free, and off they flew. Now, the way the news presented it was as if this was brand new uh, and as if this was, you know, extremely important like the rest of the gospels. There was some importance actually in in that revelation. It wasn't something new. It's called the gospel of Thomas. It's been in possession for a long time. The story in question, Jesus and the pigeons, has actually been translated quite a while ago. This was just a great story about the faithfulness of textual transmission in the ancient world. It's not really what they focused on, but that's really what was important uh, for our sake. Actually, the Gospel of Thomas is several hundred years removed from the events of Jesus's life, unlike the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the epistles for that matter, which come right up to the time. That account did not have apostolic authorship in that it was written hundreds of years after the event. So obviously Thomas didn't write it, just named the Gospel of Thomas, unlike the other Gospels or the epistles. And at the time the canon was set, unlike the other gospels and the epistles, it did not have widespread embrace and widespread knowledge throughout the world at the time. It was only rather sporadic. That's why it wasn't included in the canon. End of the interruption. Just thought maybe you'd want to know if you've been paying attention to that news. So Jesus has allowed the interruption to happen. I'm glad you allowed that interruption to happen. And on their way they go. And this is one of those times. It often isn't like this as you're reading the scriptures. But this is one of those rare occasions where you as the reader have greater insight to the event that is going on than those who are living it. You know the woman who has been bleeding for 12 years is looking for healing. You understand the tension that is involved in this more than she does. She maybe has no idea about Jairus' daughter's emergency situation. Hers is a chronic condition. I kind of doubt Peter was saying, woo, 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 as they're worming their way through the crowds. She maybe doesn't know that a life is at stake here. And Jairus, for his part, maybe doesn't know all the trauma she has gone through. While it is a chronic condition, it's been going on for 12 years, means she's lived in spiritual isolation for that long. She has been ritually unclean, ritually impure. She has been segregated from the faith life of her community. This is her shot. She's got to take it. If only I can reach out, brush up against Jesus, and touch him. Who can blame her? And we know, as the reader, that she isn't really even looking to cause an interruption. She doesn't try to stop Jesus like this, take a long time explaining what is going on, all the pain she's gone through. She's doing this down on the the sly. This is like trying to get a selfie with a famous person who's standing over there and they don't even know you got a camera. It's Jesus. who stops, causes the interruption, so to speak. She's just looking for the bleeding to stop and cease it did as soon as she touched him. But Jesus, knowing the power had gone out from him, stopped and says, who touched me? Now, first of all, the disciples say, everybody, everyone's brushing up against us, Jesus. I mean, it's packed in here or out here. How how can you ask who's even touching you? Now, I personally believe, Mark doesn't record this, but I am pretty darn certain this is the truth. Jesus knew who it was that touched him, right? 
You guys know that. Jesus knew who it was that touched him. He could have said, hey, you in the pink. But he didn't. He wanted to give her more than she had already experienced. And she had experienced so much. She had been healed. Removed was the shame. Removed was the pain. Removed would be the isolation. Removed would be the the moniker of unclean. He wanted to give her more. And he wanted the crowd to know what she knew, that he was the source of health and restoration, not only in body, but spirit as well. And so he waited and waited and waited. And Mark doesn't tell us how long this took, but even if it were a few minutes, what do you think Jairus was doing? Well, maybe it's sand dial. Right? <laughs> Jesus, we got to get going. My daughter is dying. Finally, the woman steps forward. She gets to confess before the crowd who she knows Jesus to be, the healer of ills. And he gets to proclaim before them who she is, a daughter of his who has been made whole. And that's when everything falls apart for Jairus and his family. Don't bother the master anymore. Your daughter is dead. Excuse me? Excuse me, says Jesus. Puts his hand on Jairus' shoulder. Just trust and believe. It won't be the last of his interruptions that day. Jesus will go on. They'll arrive at the house. The mourners are there. They are weeping and they are wailing. The little girl is laying dead in her bed. And Jesus says, stop the crying. She ain't dying. She's just sleeping. And they start laughing. You know, for Jesus... I believe she or he is just sleeping is a euphemism for dead. He'll actually say that of Lazarus as well in a different gospel. They're just dead. What that really means is that for Jesus, waking the dead is easier than for Mrs. Kreitzer to wake her husband on Sunday afternoon when golf is on TV and his eyes are securely shut. Jesus will rouse the dead. He will even interrupt that to give what he is that he has come to give. And on that final interruption, it happens. Little girl, I say to you, get up. Not so fast, reaper. Little sleeper, rise. And rise, she does. And the account ends. We actually don't know what happens to any of the principles in this story save Jesus from this point on out. Don't know what that little girl became and what she did. Don't know how the the woman's family responded when she showed up whole or how the community welcomed her. Don't know what Jairus went on to do. Just kind of ends. The story. The reality continues on, though, in your life and in mine. This is not just a history lesson. There's something powerful to be taken from this text. The first is this. If you have experienced the Lord's interruption after a long-waited period, if you have been longing and praying and hoping for peace, or freedom, for comfort, 
or for health. This text is a reminder that the one who has said, it is gone, it is well, is worthy of your praise. Son, daughter of his, rejoice. If on the other hand, you are right now going through that and you are longing for his interruption, if right now you need freedom from shame or from sickness, from fears or from frustrations, from isolation or from illness, just believe. Just trust. Keep on asking. He's not slow in delivering, as some understand slowness. It will come, whether in time or in in eternity. On that, you can be certain. And if neither is the case, just wait. (laughs) It will be. And when it happens, you can know this. The Lord will indeed interrupt as he is ready. So as you wait, believe and trust. And join me as we pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for those times in our lives where you have stepped in and restored. We thank you for that great interruption, the one you have brought when full healing has come our way and the words of forgiveness because you rose from your sleep in the grave after three days. And Lord, we pray that even now, as we long and as we wait, we would reach out in faith, knowing that you are the one who makes all things well until we experience it by sight. Give us your spirit that we might ever trust it by faith. In your name we pray. Amen.